Hey guys, Dr. Gooden back again to talk about statistics with you. This time we'll be talking about percentiles. How do we compare scores from different types of measurements and how do we know if a score is good or not good? Let's find out. Like I said in the intro, percentiles are a great way to compare scores of different measures. So let's say you take a group of individuals and you test their vertical jump and then you test their broad jump. Well, those are very similar measurements, but we know that you can't compare the distance you can broad jump to the height that you can vertical jump without any other knowledge. A great way to do this is using percentiles. Percentiles allow us to convert raw scores into percentiles that we can compare against other types of measurements or just to evaluate how good a score is compared to the rest of the scores. Okay, let's find out how. Now this all comes from chapter three in the book Statistics in Kinesiology by Vincent and Ware. Great textbook. Let's dive in. So some key terms to know before we get started. Most of us are familiar with the word cent or the prefix cent that we see in a lot of our English words, and it's a Latin word for hundred. The word percent means by the hundred. So a percentile then is a point or position on a continuous scale of 100 theoretical divisions such that a certain fraction of the population of raw scores lies at or below that point. That, that was a little bit confusing, so here are two examples. If I say the 75th percentile this is a score that is equal to or surpasses three-fourths of the scores in the raw data set. So if you score in the 75th percentile of a standardized test, what that means is that you did fairly well. Three-quarters of the people scored below you or at that level. And there was only about a quarter of the population that took the test that scored above you. Now the 33rd percentile is a score that is equal to or surpasses one-third of the scores in the raw data set. Okay, so this is a much lower score compared to the data. Only about a third of individuals scored lower than it or at the same level. Now, a high percentile or a low percentile, it sort of depends on what type of score you're looking at on whether that is good or bad. So perhaps it's a score on a test, well then a high percentile will be good. The higher percentile, the better. Uh, but maybe it is the number of cigarettes that you smoke each day, and so you would want to be in a very, very low percentile for that uh, particular measurement. Some more key terms. A standard score is a score that is derived from raw data and has a known basis for comparison. Okay, so a VO2 max of 40 milliliters per kilogram per minute. Is this score good, is it bad, or is it just okay? I know a lot of you who have taken exercise physiology know that that's about average, maybe even uh, maybe a slightly below average for males. You already have a basis for determining whether that score is good, bad, or okay. But if you know that that score is in the 65th percentile for the age and sex of that person who is measured, then you can interpret it. You can tell them, well, you're above average, you're above 50% right? And 65%, that's, that's decent. Sure, there's room for improvement, but that's fairly good. So percentiles are commonly used in clinical and educational settings because we want to educate our clients and our patients and our students about how they are ranking so that it gives them a really good and clear gauge. So the two things that standard scores allow us to do really well are to evaluate raw scores and to compare two sets of scores that have different units. Now, in the intro, I mentioned vertical jumps and horizontal jumps. Those have the same units, although you'll jump a lot farther than you will jump high. But what if you're comparing vertical jumps to your back squat 1RM? Well, to compare those two measures, you would first convert them into percentiles so that you could see where you line up in the percentile of vertical jump and where you line up in the percentiles of your back squat. Now we need to be aware of floor and ceiling effects in percentiles when we're interpreting our data. What a ceiling effect is, is this phenomena that 
an improvement at the higher end of the range of scores typically yields a smaller percentile improvement than at the middle range of the scores. So as an example, let's say that you were comparing your back squat one repetition maximum to the back squat one RMs of everybody else who trains in the country, okay? And let's say that you're, you're kind of an intermediate to novice weightlifter. You have been training for a little while, maybe a year or two, uh, but you haven't put in you know, five years or a decade of weight training. And so let's say that you take your back squat from 90 kilograms to 100 kilograms, a 10 kilogram improvement, and that is going to shoot you up quite a few percentile numbers because in that range, there are a lot of people who max out right around 90 to 100 to 110 kilograms, okay? So you will traverse a lot of the population. However, if you are already an elite squatter, let's say that you're squatting 250 kilograms and you make that same 10 kilogram improvement, there's not a lot of people up there who are squatting that much. And so not very much of the squatting population will be between 250 and 260 kilograms. So you will not raise your squat very many percentile points. However, that same 10 kilogram improvement in your back squat 1RM represents a huge milestone for that elite lifter. Whereas for the lifter who goes from 90 to 100 kilograms, sure, that's great, but it's to be expected. It's just part of the due diligence of training. We expect that somebody who is beginning their training career will make that kind of improvement and even more so. So sure, it's to be commended, but that lifter who adds 10 kilos to his elite back squat, that's even more impressive. But the percentile change would not show that. The percentile change would be smaller at that high end. Now here are some common percentile divisions. We can use the term quartile to refer to 25% increments in the percentiles. The first quartile would be the lowest, or that first 25%, and then the second, third, and fourth quartiles. We can also use deciles if we want to get more granular. These follow the same logic. They are just divided now into 10 equal units instead of to four. So the bottom 10% is in the first decile, and then 20%, and then 30%, etc. Now, how do we determine a percentile from a score? To calculate a percentile from a rank order distribution, we calculate the fraction of scores that fall at and below the score of interest. Remember that you also have to count the scores that fall at that same score. So let's say we have a group of people completing basketball free throws, they have 10 tries, and we want to know what percentile rank for the raw score of six made free throws is. All right, so find the number six, there it is. Of all of these scores, and there are 15 of them, because you can see n equals 15, nine of them fall at or below a raw score of six. So we want to count the score itself, six, so that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Okay, so there are 15 scores overall, and we see that nine divided by 15 equals 0.6. We convert that into a percentage, and that's 60%. So we can say that a score of six out of 10 falls in the 60th percentile for this particular sample. We can't forget that our data is based on the sample of data that we're looking at. We can't necessarily extrapolate it to the general population of people who attempt to shoot free throws. Now, if there's a tie, for instance, here we have three fives in a row. Remember that we count the score itself any score at or below that score goes into the goes into the percentile. Let's count them. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight divided by 15 is 0.53. So a score of five is, is the 53rd percentile. And all three of those individuals who scored five out of 10 free throws are considered to be in the 53rd percentile. Now, sometimes it's important to set maybe a cutoff percentile. Let's say that you are part of the admissions team at a college or university, and you want to set a certain percentile that students have to achieve on some standardized test in order to be eligible to apply to your university. Well, you would have to then figure out what scores actually fall in that percentile, and it might change year to year. If you are 
basing it on the previous year's worth of testing data, then you would have to recalculate it for every new batch of students. So let's say that only the top 25% of a class gets an A. So if you subtract 25 from 100, then you get 75. So that's the 75th percentile that you have to figure out uh, what that score is. So the steps would be to convert it to a decimal, then multiply the decimal by the number of scores and count that many scores up from the bottom. So let's do that for our free throw example. If we want to know the bottom third cutoff for free throw data, and remember, we can't just count the number of scores and divide into thirds. We want to know the bottom 33% of the actual scores. So we change 33.3 into a decimal. We multiply that by 15 because 15 is the number of people who completed the free throws. And we get that that is equal to five scores. Five scores up from the bottom. One, two, three, four, five. And that is four. For somebody to be in the bottom third of this data, as far as percentiles go, they would have had to score four or fewer free throws. Sometimes we need to round off to the nearest integer to determine the count from the bottom. So in this case, the 50th percentile would be 7.5 spots up from the bottom. And 7.5 would fall right here, right in between seven and eight, but we would round up to eight. And in this case, it's five either way, but even if it wasn't even if it wasn't five, we would still round up to eight. It's pretty simple to find the percentile when you have a rank order distribution, but what about when you have a simple frequency distribution? So here's an example of a simple frequency distribution looking at basketball free throws completed out of 10 attempts, just like the last example, except for now we have an N of 60. Here you see the frequency and here you see the cum cumulative frequency. For this example, if we look at how many people made seven or fewer free throws, we can see that 12 people scored seven, but 43 people scored seven or fewer free throws. Out of the 60 people that took the test, 43 people scored at seven or below. So we divide 43 by 60 to get 0.716, convert that to a percent, and we have 71.6%. And if we wanted to round up, we would say a person who made seven free throws ranks equal to or better than about 72% of those people who took the test. Now a grouped frequency distribution is a little bit different because we don't know where exactly the scores lie within those groups. We know that there are groups and we know how many scores fall in that group, but we don't know how those scores are distributed necessarily. So now we have a group frequency distribution for a softball throw for distance. And you see that the farthest throws were between 220 and 229 feet and the shortest throws would be from 80 to 89 feet. So what is the percentile rank of a student who threw the softball 146 feet? Well, the first step is to figure out where that group lies in the table. So that would be right here between 140 and 149. But again, because it's grouped, we don't know exactly where the score falls. We don't know if the other scores are above that 146 or below that 146 within that group. So we must use a new approach based on the real limits. If you recall from the previous chapter where we talked about the limits that we set in frequency distributions, grouped frequency distributions, we know that the real limits are the limits by which we actually put numbers into the table. So the real limits for in this case are 139.5. That's the lower limit because if something is, is 139.4, you would put it into the bin below up to 149. 0.49 because anything any higher than that would then round up into the next bin. So we use this equation. It looks complex at first, but don't let it throw you off. It's actually fairly simple. We already know all of these numbers. X has to do with the score. L is the lower limit of the bin. I is the bin size. 
f is the frequency within that bin, and c is a cumulative frequency at that point, and finally n is the total sample. All we need to do is plug those numbers in, and you can just keep that equation tucked away in your notes, and when you need to calculate the percentile, just pull it out and plug in those numbers. So if we plug in all of those numbers, we get that that score of 146 is 39.6%. So it's at or above 39.6% of the scores from this sample. And that's really all there is to it. Now I'll show you how to do all of this in Excel efficiently for large data sets in a future video. All right guys, thank you so much for watching this video. If you had any questions, let me know down in the comments. If you want to check out the next video, we will be talking about measures of central tendency, the mean, median, and the mode, and how to find them and what they mean for us. Until next time, move well, live well, and teach other people to do the same.